Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Good? Excellent. Thank you guys for joining us online. If you're gathering at one of our locations, uh, thank you. Please let us know you're there. Let us know where your uh, prayer requests are. Tell us about your testimony from this week. Uh, guys, we are going to finish up our series, The Scandal of Christmas, today. Um, so let's, let's get right into it. Let's, let's pray. Uh, Father God, we ask you right now, Lord, continue to be here. Lord, we welcome to your presence, your spirit into, into this building, into, into uh, our hearts. Lord, I pray right now that you would remain with us. Lord, speak to us through this word. Uh, make sure that, that it's your words being spoken today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so in the last four weeks, we've talked about Mary and her role, Joseph and his role, that, that long, horrible week it must have been to travel that roughly 90 miles to Bethlehem. And then the manger versus, you know, what, what was expected for, for the, the, the king, the savior to be, to be born in and to be, and be found in, in that, that evening. And so today we're going to talk about the, the strange messengers, right? And so the overall arching theme of this, this month, right, has been God's ability and, and desire to use people that we wouldn't have expected. We didn't see um, certified to do his will. Right, and so we don't want to leave this month behind and and not understand, not have a greater appreciation for and understanding that God's going to use whoever He wants, and we don't get to decide who that's going to be, and we don't need to look at at, at people's credentials or their certifications to believe that that you need to have gone to school and gotten a degree. You need to have done all these things and, and been anointed by a church. God is, God's Holy Spirit anoints each one of us to go out and do works and be used. And so we want to recognize, we want to understand and appreciate that that's what God has for us. Um, it's, not, it's not the outward appearance we see. We see time and time again, the people God is using in this sermon series, in, in this specific event in history, He's using people of great character, people who love him, who will respond to his word. It doesn't matter their place in, in society, uh, their, their rank amongst men. And so we don't want to limit ourselves or other people based on our perceptions of them. And so we find ourselves in Luke chapter 2. We're going to read through verses uh, 8 through 21 here if you want to follow along. It says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of, of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. So, again, the, the, the messengers we see here, not the likely messengers, right? But, but why are they not the likely messengers? Right, so when we look at these, these shepherds, these guys out in the field working, doing layman's work, they, they were not the people, the men we would have expected to have foreknowledge, be the first ones to know, and the first ones to be sent out to go share the word, the good news that the Savior was born. And so one of the things that, that disqualified them in our eyes would have been their religious standing, their religious understanding. These were guys who probably went through school till they were about eight or nine, maybe, learning what they, did, what they could about Torah, and then, and then they went 
into working in the fields as little, little shepherd boys and grew up to be shepherds. So they didn't have the voice. They didn't have the audience. They weren't positioned. They, they didn't have the great understanding of scripture that so many others would have had in their generation. And so there's, there's these men who are their, their position in the religious community and their understanding of the word is going to be limited. It's going to be unremarkable. We don't even know their names or their, or their, their commitment level at this point, right? And because of, because of the way the community was structured at that time, they weren't positioned to be messengers. They weren't positioned to be the ones to go out with a huge megaphone and, and share the news with so many people. Because again, their, their, their place in the community just didn't give them that opportunity. They were less focused, right? So there are people who are spending their entire time reading the word, regurgitating the word, rescripting the word time and time again. That's what they're spending their whole lives doing. And then there's these guys who are probably going and they're, they're honoring the Sabbath, right? They're, they're honoring the commandments of the Lord. They're, they're going and, and they're hearing the word read to them. They probably don't even have the ability to read it all themselves, given their education level. So they're less focused on the word and, and when is the Messiah coming and trying to read the signs and, 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 and paying attention to the stars and, and, and trying to figure all that out so they could be the first to know. That was not their focus. They're worried about their daily activities, probably worried about their next meal more than anything, making sure they don't lose the master's sheep more than anything, right? They're not focused on the Savior. They're, they're, they're not reading in the Word every day, possibly, right? That, that's not their focus, and yet God chooses to use them anyway. And it's these things, this, they're, they're less religious, more than likely. They're less positioned, guaranteed, and they're less focused, more than likely. And this is what takes away their credibility. It reduces how far their, their voice can go out, and it would be trusted and honored and believed, right? So these are disqualifying things in the eyes of men. And so as we look at them, we can have great appreciation from this generation. But in that generation, you got a couple crazy guys running around in the middle of the night telling you about some baby. You, you, you probably don't even know these guys. And if you do, you're not expecting them to be the one sharing. You would expect it to be in the, in the pulpit, that there would be news coming from the high priest telling you, about the coming Messiah, but that's not where it comes from. It comes from these no-name shepherds, right? But God knew their character. He knew that when he appeared, when, when he sends his angels with a message, that they'll respond, and they'll respond with great excitement, and, and, and they'll do exactly what he's asked them to do, what he's commanded them to do. And so that's what God is looking at. That's the, the internal, that they would be responsive, that they would be receptive to this news. So these likely messengers, all the people that we would say, the other people that, that should have been more likely to get that news would have been the priests, right? Those that, that knew the word, they, they read prophecy, they studied it, they, they're the ones teaching everybody else. Why wouldn't they be the ones to tell us who's coming and when he's coming. Again, based on man's standards, right? But they had, they had all the knowledge available to them. They had all the reason in the world to be the ones that we would have looked to and, and believed when they said, he's coming, he's coming, he's here. They said, he's here, we gotta look for him. King Herod or any other political figure, somebody who would have tried to um, usher in the presence of the new king, somebody who would have tried to position him with, with all the, the trappings that you would expect us to adorn him with, right? Anybody looking to maybe position themselves better by being in perfect alignment with the king and, and making sure they had influence in his life, speaking into his ear on a regular basis, right? So anybody like him, even the zealots who were so passionate about the Messiah and his coming and this desire for freedom, their misunderstanding. But, but they were, again, their, their focus, their commitment made them more eligible candidates as far as we would be concerned for somebody who would be paying attention to and would understand when the Messiah has arrived. 
And in even the parents, even, even Joseph and Mary, who knew months in advance, they could have been out there proclaiming and telling everybody. They could have been sharing their word. They could have been elevating themselves and saying, no, 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 what you see, this is not a scandal. This is the Messiah. He's on his way. We're his parents. Let us tell you about him. Right? They could have, they could have promoted themselves in this as much as they were promoting him. And yet we don't see them doing that. Again, people of good character, people God could trust to carry out his plans and not corrupt it for themselves. That's God's plan. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, we see, but, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. So these Kings, priests, and prophets, right? They have purposes. They have different purposes, and God uses them accordingly, right? That's his design. But God has the right and exercises his right quite frequently to use whoever he wants, and we almost always see it being not that person in a high position, in a, in a, in a position we knew much about. It's usually an introduction to a person, right? Right as they're being used, we don't know their whole life story ahead of time because that part's not really relevant. But if we only focus on the people with the position or the, or the notoriety, right, we're likely going to miss out on the real message, on the truth being shared. Now, it's great. Again, God positions people to be priests, prophets, kings, Leaders in the, in, in the, the secular world, he, he places people in position for reasons, and, and we need to honor and respect those things. But just know that we don't expect and we shouldn't expect when we see how God works, all his good news, all prophecy, all announcements, all things to be done by God to be done by those people in position. He's usually choosing the people in lower status. So more significantly, we'll intentionally disregard and, and discount the, the one he's choosing. That's, that's the position we don't want to be in, right? We don't want to look to all these high position people, the famous people who've got um, that, that huge megaphone, that influence in the community. Because if we're looking at them and expecting them to be the ones, then we've already set expectations that it can't be the people we don't know, we don't know about, we don't trust, that don't have the huge following. And when we do that, we put ourselves in, the, in a horrible position of possibly discrediting, discounting the truth as it's coming out. That's the major point, right? So, so we as believers in, in our pursuit of God, that, that we would pursue him on a greater level, we'd be, we'd be looking everywhere and we would not discount anything. We would have to use discernment over time. We would test messages. We would test prophecy. We would test any message that says it's from God against the spirits. We, we would weigh it against the word of God and decide with discernment, is that of him? But we don't want to find ourselves in that position of discounting others or ourselves from being used, right? These shepherds, Mary and Joseph, they could have discounted themselves and said, we're not the ones. We expect it to be somebody else. This is clearly nonsense. I, I'm not ready to be a part of this. I'm not, I'm not ready to move. I don't have enough courage to be in that position. So one of the things we want to do is we don't want to crack the code. We want to just, we want to listen with anticipation. What I mean by that is there are people who diligently and honorably read through the word because they want to understand God. But some people have this habit of we look at all the little things, like we're trying to break some unlockable code. We want to be the first to know, right? We, we want to be the one who knows most. That's our culture is that, that we, we either got to go out first and tell everybody that first, right? Because we just, we're in the know, or we have to know the most. We need to be willing to say, you know, I, I'm not the one who knows everything. And we want to know the character of God, because when you know the character of God and how he works and, and who he uses, you'll be able to discern what's real and what's not, what's true and what's not. So in Esther 4:14, 4, we see, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But if you and your father's family, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Now this is 
It's funny that I would, I would pull this verse out as we talk about Esther and people in low position, right? Because today's message is focused on anybody being used, and yet we go to Esther, right? Esther is positioned royally. She is, she is not a person with great authority, right? So, but she's positioned in the royal court, and this doesn't disqualify her by any means, right? Again, God's going to use whoever he wants. But her royal position is not like that of the king. She's just close enough to have an audience with him. And so the focus needs to be on the such a time as this, not her position. She's, she's ready to be used at such a time as this. And it took some, some coaching. It even took some coaxing to get her to a place where she was ready to even consider going to the king and speaking on the behalf of the Jews. But in doing so, she sought the Lord's guidance. She was in prayer and she was fasting and she was ready to move and she finally did. And so while she was close to the throne, she was used because of her, her, her position, her, her access, even as a, as a minor person in that relationship, not the major person in that relationship. So what we want to take away from this, this weekend is how to be usable, how to be like the shepherds, how to be like Mary and Joseph, right? We, we want to be usable for God's purposes. So the first thing you got to stop doing is stop comparing yourself to others, right? Because there's usually only two outcomes that are going to happen when you compare yourself to others. Either you start thinking too highly of yourself, right? And then you find yourself in a bad position, it's corrupting your character, even if you started out with pretty decent character. As we compare ourselves, we start ranking ourselves. You know what? I'm pretty good at, at, at this. I'm, I'm above other people. We start disqualifying them. The other is we start to disqualify or discount ourselves. We say, I'm, I'm not the one God can use or will use in this moment. So we want to avoid comparing as much as possible. But each one of us needs to believe that, that we are we do hold value with God. We are valuable to him. And we need to each believe that he's called us for a purpose, general purpose and specific purpose, time and place. And each one of us need to believe that that is enough. That, that because he, he loves us and, and places value on us and that he has specifically called us to do something, that we, that's enough. That's all we need. If you got the education, good, pursue it. If you got, you got means and you got resources, good, use them. But there's no pre-qualification we see time and time again where God uses anybody and it's not those who are highly esteemed, highly positioned. So if we wanna be usable, we wanna watch and listen, right? So we can't walk around with our, our head in the clouds all day with our, our earbuds in. We, we have to allow God time to speak to us. And reading the word is good, but we, sometimes we just need that quiet time. Sometimes we just need to turn the radio down, turn the TV off, a little less distraction. We need to be intentional about, about allotting God a specific time in our day and in our, in our week to be able to reach us. Every morning we could start out with just the simple request, God, I'm ready to be used today. Please use me. How would you like to use me? Mentally and emotionally prepare yourself for that. And we need to be available in this, in this setting aside time. This what we would call in our culture, creating white space on your calendar, right? Blank space in your calendar that you would say, you know what? Nothing is going to interrupt this time. Nothing's going to come in and audibly distract me. Your, your mind's a distraction enough, right? The, the obligations and the commitments you have in the rest of the world, they're enough. But to say, you know what? I'm going to give 30 minutes of my time or I'm going to give 40 minutes of my time, two hours, whatever it is for each one of you with your schedule. You can start out small, but we need to say, you know, I'm going to give God his time to speak to me. That's how we become usable. That's how we increase our ability to be used. Right? So the flip side to this message is not just about us and that we might be used like the shepherds or Mary or Joseph, but that we would not rule out others. And we would, we would not be a stumbling block for others that God has called to move in this world. And so the first thing we want to do when we're talking about others moving for God is we want to avoid judgment. Now we want to exercise some discernment. 
We don't need to respond to everything everybody says that, that is the will of God. But in Romans 14, 4, it tells us, Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Now, that means we're not here to condemn others, okay? That doesn't mean we shouldn't weigh their words against the word of God, against the character of God that we should continually be getting to know and understand on a deeper level, right? But God's servants don't need so much cross-examination that they can't get anything done. We don't need to be their stumbling block. So if you want to examine from a distance, you want to weigh those words, please do so. Do it discreetly, but make sure you're weighing it on his word, not your emotions about the situation, not, not based on your expectations of, of who should have been used in this moment and, and therefore limiting your ability to understand that, right? So if we were witnessing these, un, these events unfold 2,000 years ago, we probably would have been judging wrongly, right? The culture would have told us these aren't the guys. You can't believe them. They've got no credibility. There is no Messiah being born out there right now because the high priest hasn't told you about it. Nobody came out of the tent of meeting and told us about it. Or out of the, out of the, from behind the veil. Again, we want to watch and listen, right? In this time of discernment, watching others. We, we want to pay attention to what's being said, but I would encourage you, listen to the message, not the words, right? Because when you listen to the words, you're more, more likely to take an offense because you didn't like the way they phrased something, right? More likely to be uh, stumbling over details ver versus the greater message, and there are people that dedicate their entire time and career to criticizing other people on how they say something about God in his word. That may be constructive every once in a while. That may be healthy every once in a while as we contend for the gospel, as we, as we try and share the honest message of God's, of God's message for each one of us. We want to we share it accurately. But in the grand scheme of things, if somebody is sharing the gospel, we should be in support of that. Even if we don't agree with everything they're saying, okay, fine, extract the 10 words you don't like and, and let the rest of the message stand tall. Examine the message, not the words. Examine the, the character of the person versus one act that's gonna be exploited to tear this person down and then how, somehow disqualify everything they're saying and doing that is the will of God. And then lastly, that we, we don't impede, right? And so initially I was going to say that we want to assist these people, but let's be honest, some of us can't work well together. And some of us don't work at the same speed. We don't have the same skill, ability, uh, availability, whatever it may be. And so I'm not going to tell you you need to go assist everybody. You, you should work with everybody doing the will of God because some of y'all might slow either, each other down. Some of y'all might create more conflict than, than healthy relationship. So we just want to do no harm. We don't want to get in the way. That needs to be the philosophy. Not that I need to get my hands on everything. Some of us want to control stuff a little bit too much, right? And with, with, the more we try and control it, the less it's allowed to grow and spread. And so we don't need to have our hands on everything. I don't need you to participate in everything. God doesn't need you to do that. Just don't get in the way of those doing what God has called them to do. Now, if you can manage working with someone and partnering with them, and sharing in a ministry, or two, or three, or outreach, whatever, whatever we want to call it, whatever we, we want to do, reaching in the church, reaching out of the church, we, we want to work well with others, and you're okay to do that. I'm not telling you you can't. I'm just saying the mission is not to assist. It's just not to impede. We don't want to silence others because we believe they lack the qualifications, the certifications. No, I, uh, I don't know if I shared this with you guys. It was like two years ago, we had some guy, we, we hired a guy to, to come in and put in a, a door I was not qualified to do to working in the security realm. Big like, you know, 700 pound steel door. And this is a guy who he's credentialed. He went through the classes. He's done other doors before. We expect he's, he's gonna be able to figure it out. We got all the pieces laying around. I'm there to help him. I'm a set of hands. He's looking at the pieces. He's like, uh, they gave us the wrong door. It's not going to go in right. 
And it was in this conversation, it really occurred to me, you know, it's not, not like I didn't know it before, but it just really occurred to me, you know what? Certification does not equal qualification. This guy had the, he had the credentials, he'd gone through the class, he'd even had experience. He couldn't look at the door and realize that we did have all the right parts. I had to ask him a simple question like, what if we just turn it around and it works just fine, right? Sometimes we get a little too close to the problem, but we don't need to be looking at people's credentials. We don't need to look at their certification, their, their degrees to somehow testify to their ability to be used. We need to be willing for anybody to be used. We don't want to discount them. We, we don't want to silence them because we don't agree with a portion of their theology. Or there's, there's plenty of, I mean, you, you could never go to church again and you could listen to sermons for every waking moment for the rest of your life because there's enough stuff online right now. There are so many people out there preaching the word of God and we don't need to tear them down because we don't agree with one message or a portion of a message. We need to let them do their work. We need to show grace for they are human. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to misspeak. Hopefully they'll correct it if they say something wrong. But are, they, are we going to say that everybody that says the wrong thing that we don't agree with Somehow we assume we got it all figured out, right? We, we know all there is to know about theology and about God, that we don't make room for other people to get something right and us to be a little wrong. So I would, I would say with this, don't impede, have, have grace. Ask for the ability to extend greater grace and not take offense to somebody you don't agree with on every topic, on every issue, on every verse that they would come to a, a different conclusion. Now, when we're talking about salvific issues and, and, and what we do with Jesus when we read through Scripture, that's a different story. Right? We, need to, we need to make sure that we hold true to that and we call out fallacy, we call out heresy. That's fine. But we don't need to make the little things big things. And know this, the first coming was not heralded by a single religious person, not a single person with the credentials we would have expected. And so when you look at people on a stage or with a microphone or in a pulpit, the best thing you can expect from us is to hear about what season it is, that it is the last days, that we can expect his arrival soon, that a certain couple things need to happen based on our understanding of reading prophecy before he arrives. But when we look at what God does and, and what he's probably going to do, it's not going to be somebody up here telling you, look in the sky. Here comes the son at the right hand of the father. It's going to be somebody out there on social media one day that happens to look up in the sky and they're going to film it and it's going to go viral or something other th like that. Don't wait for the message from here or from anybody else preaching the gospel in this capacity to be the ones to tell you that his second coming is imminent or it's right now. The best we can tell you, the best we're allowed to tell you is the season. So run from anybody selling you something different and be ready for the one you weren't expecting, the one with no qualifications, the one with no certifications, to be used by God in that moment. That's our God, that's who he uses, that's how he works. Again, shaming the, the things we would elevate in this world, using the weak, not the strong, not the high positioned. That's the scandal of Christmas, that's, that's how our God works. So be ready for it, to set your hearts for that, that you would, you would not be willing to impede somebody else, that you would believe that you are capable of being used and that alone puts you in position to be used. If you guys stand, we'll, we'll pray, we'll get out of here. Father God, we, we thank you for your word that we can, we can go back and we can see who you use and how you use them and you do it so frequently. We thank you for that, Lord, that, that we don't have to 
try and believe people in high position. Lord, we can look for your greatness. We can look for your love. We can look for your message in anybody. We can listen for it, Lord. I pray that right now that, that you would put our hearts, our minds, and our ears in position where we can hear and receive all that is good, Lord. Please help us filter what's wrong, what's evil, what's not for us, Lord, what's not of you. But allow, uh, keep us in a position where we are humble enough to hear your word and be moved by it to be obedient, Lord. Ask for blessing over everybody hearing these words today, Lord, as we're out on the, uh, on the town or on the streets tonight, I pray that everybody would be safe and we would all have a fantastic beginning to our 2024, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If anyone needs prayer, we'll be right up here for you guys. And a reminder, starting points at 1210 today in the conference room.